<laughs> thank you guys. Thank you everybody uh, for joining. And I apologize about the uh, technological uh, hiccups that we had, but I think we're all on and we can hear each other. Um, and thank you for those that are on the Zoom and those of you that are streaming uh, on Facebook and other platforms. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, get going on, uh, we're going to get the conversation going. This is an important uh, conversation uh, about activism, politics, and sports. And, you know, the idea came about uh, from our organization and for those of you that are not uh, familiar with um, ADC, it's the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee, we're the country's largest uh, Arab American civil rights organization. And for those of you wondering why is ADC putting on this conversation, I ask why not? You know, this is a conversation that impacts uh, all of us. Uh, uh, all brown and black people are facing the same issues in this country in one way or another, and some have been facing them um, for, you know, far far more and far longer than the Arab community has. So it's important to learn and understand uh, and get an understanding of where we are uh, at this moment in history. Um, and to understand that history, um, it's important to hear the stories and to hear the experiences of folks that are out there doing the work. And that's why we have this great panel uh, of, of individuals who have really stood on their principles and who have done uh, tremendous work uh, throughout the years. Uh, the idea came about, of course, when the uh, last dance uh, the Chicago Bulls documentary was on, uh, that's on ESPN. I spoke to Khaled. I'm like, man, how are they having this whole uh, uh, docu-series and not mentioning uh, anything going on in the 90s? You had the Iraq War. Uh, you had the stance that our, our uh, guest uh, Craig Hodges took. You have the stance that our other guest Mahmoud Abdul-Roof took in the 90s. You had the LA riots and so many things happening in the 90s that were glanced and often not uh, discuss. So that's why we felt it's important to get this uh, conversation on record, just kind of um, get an idea of what happened, what's going on, where we were, where we've been. And a lot of these issues are still uh, happening. Um, a lot of our membership, a lot of the folks signing on, you may not know Craig Hodges or Mahmoud Abdul's story. Maybe you were too young. Maybe you were, uh, you know, not into sport uh, or just weren't paying attention. But um, what I'm going to do is start off by asking Khaled and Mark each a question. Uh, and then we're going to get into a, a conversation. But I just want to open up with a question uh, to Khaled and Mark. Why um, the, the importance of Mahmoud and Craig, the, the importance of what they've done and what it means, uh, not just to, to sports fans, not just to uh, folks that followed them, but to all of us, to, to everybody in the movement, the, you know, what they did what, and how that's impacted us today, what it means to you uh, personally. So if we can get that going, uh, started. Mark, you can go ahead. Okay, cool. Um, so, Mark, welcome everybody. I, I, uh, I, I think for me, we're at a moment um, of urgency. There's uh, so much desperation, so much poverty, so much violence, uh, so much chaos, so much disorder in the world. And at a moment like this, we need courageous voices more than ever. And part of what it means to have a Mahmoud Abdul-Rauf or a Khadiz is to understand that there is a tradition of brave voices to speak out. When I speak out as an as a activist or as an academic or as a media figure, in some sense, there's an expectation that that's my job, depending on the topic, but that's my job. When, when Khalid speaks out, you know, they say, well, he's a, he's a writer, he's an activist, that's, that's what they do. But when people who have something at stake, when people who have something to lose are courageous enough to speak up and speak out, they do a couple of things. One, they challenge what counts as common sense. Because they, they have an opportunity to speak out against issues that everyday folk who aren't thinking about politics are doing, right? So, so when, when Craig speaks out and says, wait a minute, we need to be building rich basketball players, we need to be building stuff here. We, we need to be protesting here. We need to be, we need ownership. We need black owners. Um, when he says, to, when he hands George Bush a letter, an eight page letter, he's doing something. And now the whole world is looking in a different way. What they're also doing is redefining what an athlete is, uh, which particularly when we talk about black athletes, this idea of shut up and dribble didn't start with Lord England and LeBron James, right? Mm. Nobody wanted uh, Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf to, to, to have a conscience. No one wanted him to make courageous decisions based on his faith. No one wanted him to challenge the American empire and what it meant to have an allegiance to it. 
Nobody want him to do that. They want him to, to, to they want to see that sick handle. <laughs> they want to see him get buckets, right? Right. So, right. So that becomes part of the conversation. So for me, when I see these two gentlemen, I see two people who were willing to stand up and speak out when they had something at stake. They didn't wait till they were 50 and retired. They didn't wait until they were 60 and couldn't get another contract. Craig Hodges was the best shooter in the NBA. Right? Who could stop Jackson at LSU? Who could stop Mahmoud Abdul Rauf in the NBA? Nobody. Right? So they had stuff on the line and they still spoke up. They're, they're in the tradition of Muhammad Ali. They're in the tradition of, of Bill Russell. They're in the tradition of, of now Colin Kaepernick. He stands on their shoulders. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be seen as an isolated figure. I want them to know, people to know these young folk in particular, people younger than me, that, that, that before there's a Kaepernick, there's a Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. Before there's a Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, there's a Bill Russell. Mm -hmm. there's, a Craig there's, there's an Oscar Robertson. Absolutely. And, yes. There's a whole tradition here, and I need them to know that so that we can so that we can stand up with these people so that they don't have to be isolated, so that they don't have to get erased. The last thing I'll say is it was shameful that we watched the whole documentary right now, which is basically, and I like the documentary because I love who, but it's, it's a Michael Jordan infomercial that doesn't talk about the complex, dangerous history that they had to navigate. How can you talk about the Bulls run and talk about and talk about the entire, I mean, we, 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 I'm, I'm looking at Kent Levinson and I don't hear Craig Hackens. No disrespect to Chris Levinson, I'm just saying like, it ain't like we just doing the, the top three. We, we doing the whole team, we're strategically leaving him out. We're trying to write these men out of history. And our job today is to, is to make sure they never get written out of history. They never get written out of consciousness. And that we tell the truth in public to honor them. That's why I'm glad to be here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to echo Mark's points, I'm really excited about this conversation and I really pushed I've been in the ADC to have it, um, especially because it highlights to young people, this new millennial social media generation, um, that this, this tradition of activism, this tradition of social justice within sport is by no means a novel phenomenon. It's, it's by no means a movement that was initiated in the last couple of years by a Colin Kaepernick. Uh, there are giants who really spearheaded these movements in the 90s uh, before social media became mainstream and their influence and their impact would be exponentially greater uh, if they took the stances that they took in the 90s and in the, the 80s today. So I think it's important to bring Mahmoud and to bring brother Craig into the fore to say to these young millennials that before social justice and racial justice became a fad, right? Be before it became safe to take specific stances in the mainstream in sport and social media, that you had individuals who were at the very top of their game. I mean, look, I was a Detroit Pistons fan, Craig, <laughs> uh, but I was a Craig Hodges fan. I grew up in Detroit, big bad boys fan. Yeah. But when you handed President Bush that letter, I forever became indebted to you. And I became you. a Craig Hodges fan before a Detroit Pistons fan because I realized that the importance and the impact of athletes in sport had a significant, significant um, psychological imprint on young people. I was only a teenager at that time, but that stance you took forever stayed with me and helped steer me towards social and racial justice work. Um, so part of me, you know, kind of wishes that you guys were playing today because I think that your impact would be exponentially far greater because of social media. But I'm glad that we're having this conversation right now because it's really critical that young people, millennials, people in their teens, people in their 20s, um, not only know about your sacrifice, but know about the leadership you guys really championed uh, when you were at the top of your games. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kyle, do you want to get us going on a conversation? Right, yeah, just, you, just the first question, just to lay the foundation, uh, Craig and Mahmoud, if you can name what influences, what authors, what activists really helped shape your political consciousnesses when you were coming up. You're the elder, uh, Craig, so go ahead. Appreciate you, brotherhood. Good to see you too, Black man. Good to see you, brother. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Almighty God for blessing us to be able to speak to the people at this day and time with this madness that's going on, and hopefully everybody's safe. But this is a great conversation, and I wanted to tell Mark, Brother Hill, you know, what you've done, man, and, and the support that you've given me. I want to thank you for that and that kind of thing. But for me, like you were saying, Brother Collett, I had my, my uncles and my, grand, my granddad were influential in, in making sure that I watched athletes who were conscious. So growing up, you know, Muhammad Ali, John Carlos, and Tommy Smith, and Kurt Flood were, you know, examples that for me were people that I looked to and, and wanted to emulate on some level. If I got a chance to play professionally, I wanted to make sure that, you know, you champion the cause of people less fortunate and be able to stand on the shoulders of your ancestors, man. So for me, it was a a natural inclination and almost a cultural imperative that when we went to the White House, 
that I was able to carry the message of my people who wouldn't be able to go. Right, right. And Mahmoud, I know you you mentioned a few books and authors. I know uh, I watched an interview where you mentioned um, Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky and and, uh, and others. How how did that uh, uh, affect you and and open your eyes to some of what you've been seeing? Well, uh, there there are a host of them beyond those two, but let me piggyback on a little bit of what, what Craig Hodges said earlier. And I want to say something too about what uh, Mark Lamont said about making sure that our, our history in particular, myself and, and Craig, Craig's history is not erased, but we have the same responsibility. And I, cause I mentioned it before we got on air, man, that I really admire you guys. Uh, you know, w w uh, I kind of went before we had this, uh, that we were gonna have this conversation and I looked at some YouTube, you know, it's the age of information. So, and, and I was listening to some of the work that uh, Mark Lamont Hill was doing as well as Carla Bay doing. I said, man, we're, we're met some real intellectual heavyweights. And so, the work, <laughs> yeah, no, it, and it takes a lot of discipline. No, I'm serious. It takes a lot of discipline, man, and, and, and staying power to, to do what you do. And so when you go out on the line, too, and say things that makes people feel uncomfortable, it's our responsibility to also support you uh, on those things as well. So it's, it's, on, it's on both sides. But as far as the question, uh, those influences were well, the first really uh, uh, person that influenced me in a major way was when I was at LSU, I was handed the autobiography of Malcolm. Mm -hmm. And that really got my, my mind working. Uh, I wasn't that person at a young age where I, I was taught critical thinking skills or how to problem solve. You know, I didn't think through things. I memorized my way back, I mean, through school. And so that was the start for me. But then once becoming a Muslim man, meeting a lot of people, uh, they introduce you to material, the Noam Chomsky's, the Howard Zins, the Gore Vidal's, the Randall Robinson's, the Kwanzaa Kunjufu's, the Amos N. Wilson's, uh, 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 just a host of them. And these are the people that the more I began to read, began to, uh, you know, fashion my thinking in a way that, it, and it's hard. It's like what, what Mark said in one of his, one of his, one of his talks, man, when, when you have access to information, and, and an experience, it's hard uh, to sit on that information and not want to share it. Right. Did you all know that when you entered the professional level that you would be these voices? Was it, did you have to like, did you pause for a moment and say, you know what, let me, let me wait until I establish myself? Were, were you strategic at all or was it just like when things happen, I'm gonna speak? You know, um, from speaking from my end, I was blessed to um, have you know, get recruited to Long Beach State with the legendary text one of God bless his soul. And to have studied under Dr. Maulana Karinga from, you know, the founder of Kwanzaa, Dr. Khaled Muhammad was my, one of my professors. So I was blessed to have had two which that taught me that should I get to that level, don't forget what your responsibility and as far as researching ways in which you can have solutions for your people, man. And for me, those, uh, like, you know, like uh, uh, Mahmoud said, you know, the intellectual giants that I was blessed to be around and to be able to see the way that they moved and that kind of thing. But it also goes back to my mom and, and the civil rights organization and the models that they put on me in as far as how to go about conducting yourself in, in a matter of leadership. And, you know, being, being in front and not being afraid to stand up. The question I have, can, can you paint for the listeners and especially the younger people on, um, online right now, how the NBA was a different sort of context, a different landscape? It's now somewhat of a, a progressive league, comparatively speaking. How was it different in the 80s and the 90s? Will you speak to me or Mike Moore? Go ahead and answer it, Craig. You got it. I'll come, I'll come after you. Yeah, because it was kind of breaking up, breaking up, and, and I couldn't really uh, get the point. But I heard the last part of it, the 80s and the 90s. You know, for me, once again, the game, from the, the physical attributes of the game in the 80s to the 90s, um, was one thing, but also we didn't really have, um, it was more, more so of a silence where athletes didn't really speak on, on political issues and, and that those were things that you wanted to stay away from because it could hurt your, your earning potential. And, and many people, and when I look back at it, I say, you know, a lot of people didn't know, didn't study it enough to speak to it. And, and that was my thing that I was blessed to have had the study and the information to be able to speak to the issues as well as have a passion for it. Uh, hello? 
We can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, okay, okay, just making sure. Yeah, uh, I'll agree. Uh, I'll add to that a little bit if I can. That not only were not athletes, I don't think necessarily because of the dangers with endorsements and 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 uh, and getting contracts, not speaking out. But I think also it was encouraged, you know, also by by the league not to deal with certain issues. Mm. Uh, I, I remember, and and these are these are these are uh, these are uh, challenging issues nowadays. Even, but I remember when the issue of even homosexuality came out, people were told, "Don't say anything about it." I remember when they were talking about racism. Right? What do you think about racism? We were told oftentimes, and I don't know if it was a team to team thing or if this was something that was coming from the NBA itself, but uh, there were people going around questioning about, hey, do you think racism exists? Mm, wow. And I'm, I'm looking like, am I living in a different <laughs> world? <laughs> like, do you think racism exists in the NBA? Man, it exists in the world. What do you mean? Of course it exists in the NBA. But right. then you had so many people not speaking out against those things, but I think it was encouraged in such a way. And now it's different because, you know, now there's, as he was saying, that there's this idea that it's more progressive, right? And that guys are speaking out. But I remember reading something, I think uh, this uh, a political scientist, Richard Itten, mm -hmm. and he said that he, he cautions against viewing protests or things of that nature as inherently revolutionary. Because once it becomes routine, it's easily, it's easily yeah. accepted and adopted by the hegemony, you know? So, and, and so when I look at what's happening now, even, you know, the, the wearing of the uh, Can't Breathe shirts and all of those things, it seems more orchestrated. And, and yeah. <laughs> uh, like what happened in, in China, you know, if it's so progressive, then why when I think, uh, what's his name, Westbrook and uh, James Harden will begin to, they was about to address something and they would were, they were shut up real quick. Look, let's yeah. just deal with basketball. Um, and so I, I, I don't buy it, me personally. Uh, I think that they're, they're just more sophisticated in how they go about it. Yes. That's uh -huh. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask about I, my, my question. So this part of it is there's the policing of, of your behavior by the league, potentially about, you know, whether it's the owners, whether it's the league, whatever. Uh, but there's also a question of information. Like, do you have the sense that players have the information? Like, y'all are exceptional in certain ways. Y'all read, y'all studied. But so much of getting to the NBA is about stopping athletes from thinking and reading and making sure, and, you know, making you treat you like a professional in college, treat you like a professional in high school. Just how difficult is it for athletes to get the information? Like when, when y'all were in locker rooms, when y'all were connecting with folks, did you feel like they, that they had, that they knew a lot of this stuff or, or was there supposed to be getting that information? And now, uh, you know, and that's funny for me that you say that is that, you know, when you, there's information. <laughs> But oftentimes we don't want the information because we have to be responsible. We have responsibility to what we get. So we rather plead ignorance to the issue. And then right. that way I don't have any responsibility to it. And I think oftentimes that's what it is. It's not a matter of uh, myself or making move being exceptional or of any degree from any other athletes. It's a right. matter of positioning what you want to do and what is your motivator. And many of our athletes, the motivator is to be the best athlete you can, but also make the most money that you can. And there's not a lot of paper in, in understanding mm -hmm. issues of black folks and solving them issues. So it's a matter of, of realizing what your passion is and, and being on it, man. So a lot of brothers know, but a lot of brothers won't talk about it. That's right. Mahmoud, what you said earlier reminded me of something critical race theorist Derek Bell says. He says that civil rights, uh, civil rights steps or progress is only had when it aligns with the interests of white people, when it aligns with the interests of major with the majority. How has this, you know, sort of superficial progressivism in the NBA um, sort of shifted in line with majoritarian or white interests? So w why is it safe for athletes, for instance, like LeBron James to take specific stances, but not for James Harden and Westbrook to be critical of what's happening to Uyghur Muslims in China, for instance? Why is it? I, I missed you. Why is it safe for LeBron James to take specific stances on domestic uh, civil rights issues, but not safe for James Harden or uh, Westbrook to, to be critical of what's happening in China with, for instance, Uyghur Muslims, the persecution of Uyghur Muslims in China? Wow. That, I mean, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, the first thing that came to my mind is because he, he, he's LeBron James. <laughs> you can get away with it. Yeah, exactly. Sort of like, you know, during Craig, Craig Hodges' time, uh, uh, Jordan could get away, get away with a lot of things that uh, other, other, other people can't. Um, wow. Uh, that's that's a tough one. Uh, 
you know, you know, kind of. I would just, I, I would just say one thing, which I think Craig and Mahmoud spoke to, which is the question of money. What's at stake, right? The money yeah. makes money when, when, a, when a bunch of black people wear I can't breathe shirts. There's nothing at stake, especially when they still play the game. True, That's true. Exactly. exactly. If Donald Sterling, when they try to get Donald Sterling out of here, and people say, "Wait a minute, we won't play." If, if, if he if he's still an owner, now something now that leverage the capital, now that leverage money, now people are gonna lose some money, right? Mm-hmm. When you speak out against Uyghur Muslims in China, it's not a, it's not, it's not a, even a, they don't care about Muslims, right? They, mm-hmm. You know, in general, right? They, they, it, Chinese Muslims is not a question that that that, the, that these power brokers in the league care about, or the United States government cares about in a lot of ways. Right. But the money that they would lose from China and China matters. One billion consumers, yeah. yeah. So they're like, wait a minute, this bad. For China, China is bad for business. Exactly. We love black people, and we're gonna wear actual free t-shirts. That just makes white liberals happy. It makes black people feel like it's okay for them to show up the game. So everybody gets to pat themselves on the back for being progressive. And so, to my point about the kind of hegemony of it all, they, the the the, the resistance gets co-opted, which is because another way to make money. And it's and, and it's to me that that. And this is a, this is it goes, it goes to the question I had, which goes to your question, is how hard is it to get players to make a protest that will actually challenge the league? How hard is it, for example, to get a player to to play kind of game? That, you know, mm-hmm. you know, one of the things, you know, one of the things, brother, in in, in this whole issue of that, uh, you know, domestic versus international. I've always said that as long as we don't consider ourselves on a human rights level, we'll never get that justice. And I think whenever there's an opportunity to squelch the voice internationally of the, you know, how the injustices connect all over the planet. And that, you know, that that's, that's the part that if we can highlight in, in our nation and connect it to other nations, I think that's, that's the power that's Feared. And I think many times when you see somebody like LeBron James who has that potential to do that, I think the, the powers that be, especially in the NBA, they want to control that, that they want to be able to, to, to handle it in a way where it looks as though the player is able to be free of movement. But in fact, it's, it's certain, you know, it's a certain criterion that has to be met in order for you to be able to make those types of moves. Yeah, and I think that's what was exceptional about you, Mahmoud and Craig, is that you were true internationalists. You connected what was happening here stateside with what was happening internationally in Iraq, what was happening in the Middle East, what was happening in Africa, which seems to be sort of a um, on the decline in professional sports, even amongst conscious athletes. That tradition of internationalism was really rich in your advocacy in the 80s and the 90s. Yeah, and... and, and uh... You, you know, it's, it's it's amazing. I have some people that that are close to me, and, and we go back and forth with this sometimes, because I, I don't uh, oftentimes hear that in the language a lot. And, and I know even uh, uh, this this transnational solidarity. It's like what Martin Luther King talked about back in the day: injustice anywhere is a threat to uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Yes, but, but also, I think flip side of that: justice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. And, the, and we're all linked in some way, uh, shape, or form. And, uh, you know, when you when you suffer and when you know what oppression feels like, when you know what suffering feels like, when you know what, you know, being deprived certain, you know, uh, some of your rights feel like, you don't want that for anybody else. So, yeah, there's there's a saying that, you know, we know the saying that charity starts at home, like even in Islam. Right. There's a there's a protocol for giving. You know, a lot tells us give to your family, give to your near of kin. Then there's a list the orphan, the wayfarer, the needy. Those, you know, those who you're trying to win over, there's a list of people. So, yeah, you start with that, but you don't limit it to that. And so we can't even do that. You know, we shouldn't do that in our social relationships with with each other. Just make it a black issue. Right. And because we're we're all linked in this thing together. And I think that's the only way that we're going to, you know, I think what's the name? Uh, Ajima. I may be saying the wrong name. Ajima Luo. And in her book, you want to talk about race. She said, until we identify where our privilege intersects with somebody else's oppression, we won't really be able to bring about, you know, major change. And I think that's very important. And, and to be able to see another person struggle, whether it's in Latin America, whether it's in Asia, whether it's in Africa, whether it's in, in this country, how we have similarities in our oppression. that We have uniqueness, too, 
but how we, we need to take that and use that as a weapon to, to come together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if I can make a point why on that is that one of the things that the NBA is claimed to be um, so woke and conscious, one of the things that I, I put to them was, you know, there should be a reconcili a truth and reconciliation committee put together. Mm -hmm. And I hope that, you know, through this Facebook Live that brothers and sisters who are watching this would, would ask the NBA to open up to have a sit down with brothers like McMood and myself. And I'm sure there's brothers beyond us who were earlier who had grievances and didn't get a chance to air them. Because one of the things that, that when I was in the league early that used to bother me is how coaches would make little snide comments about how players didn't think very well. And, and the little mm -hmm. things that were, you know, insensitive and, and racist to the core. And even to the point where both McMood and myself went through what we went through at a time when David uh, Donald David uh, Donald Sterling was still an owner in the league, and that mm -hmm. that yeah. itself lends itself to some type of collusion towards the feelings that we have towards our people and oppression. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it's interesting what you just said, also, man. We're we're not exceptional in the sense. I mean, we're exceptional in the sense that what we did was exposed, right? right? And and so so it's easy to look at myself and Craig, man, they were being attacked, but there are so many other people that were yes, railroaded, right? That mm -hmm. their voice wasn't heard. This that they're, they're, they're you know uh, you don't know about their story. It is just not him and I. This happens on a consistent basis. Wow. You know yes. where people people are mistreated, and it, and it's uh, you know of course you know, it's unfair, uh, right. but it's, yeah, it's important to try to to definitely, these stories can help bring those stories out and highlight those stories even more. That's right. Mm. We got a, uh, let me ask you a question. We got a question coming in. I think uh, someone's writing in with a question as well. Um, was there a moment where you, or where someone told you, stop what you're doing and get in line or your career is going to be cut short? Was there a moment, or was, it, was, was it something expected or did you just have to figure it out for yourself? You know, for me, for me it was, um, I got, we were waived uh, July 1st, 1992. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until September when Tex Winter told me that he, bless his soul, he told me that he had contacted every team in the league on my behalf. And mm -hmm. no team called him back to ask him how Craig could help them. And at that point, he told me that it was pretty much a, a done deal in as far as getting to play again and that you know, he understood my love for the game and my ability to teach the game. So he told me at that point in time, I should probably look to teach the game in as mm -hmm. far as coaching was concerned. Yeah, for the young people on online, Craig Hodges still won the three-point competition when he was unsigned. I remember that vividly. I, no, I didn't, I, 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 competed. I, I think it, I didn't win it when I, I just competed. I didn't get oh, out of it. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I got a question. So everybody's watching the, the Last Dance right now, right? So everyone's at home, captive, watching this documentary. What what role did Michael Jordan have? You know, kind of the ascendance of Michael Jordan as a as a corporate figure, and sort of bringing about the the political sort of pacification of the league in the '90s. How did Michael Jordan like spearhead that culture uh, in becoming sort of the the, the, the primary uh, figure in the league? I know, Craig, you can speak to this. You know, it's funny to me. They tell you right there in the documentary that they say, you know, David Falk says that we we marketed Michael like a golfer, like a tennis player, like an individual athlete. Yeah. So what they're telling us that the Michael Jordan image is like a Frankenstein laboratory that we have, we know how to make this model that people will gravitate to, people will buy, and people will sell, and all 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 the above. But what what my thing is that. You know, when you have such a great athlete and such a the magnitude that Michael was, the impact that he could have internationally on on everything else is one of the things that you know. To me, I was around. I had a. I was blessed to be around Kobe. Bless his soul, also. And to see it was a difference in the mindset, the degree of what Kobe saw his impact on people. Where to me, it was more the impact that MJ saw on how he could make his bread. So it was one of those type of things. And that was the monster that they created in the lab that was Air Jordan. Mm. Oh. Uh, Mahmoud, was it, in terms of the religion, um, you know, at that point, the league just didn't have any Muslim athletes. Um, still not a large number of Muslim athletes, but more. Um, was, was, that, was, your, was your faith journey um, 
something that the, that was a challenge for you in the even the, the politics of it aside was 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 the was the faith journey itself a, a challenge for you? Of course, of course. Uh, when when I decided to become a Muslim, I was told by people, uh, and it went straight to the finances. Like, man, you might not want to do that because it may mess up your endorsements if if you have any coming your way. But but also even with the team, man, I had the trainer. You know, I went in and I was like, look, man, I have to fast during Ramadan. And he was trying to encourage me not to. And I said, listen, uh, you know, I said, uh, this is what I believe. You don't have to believe it. I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking this journey on my own. Uh, and it's amazing that after I made that decision, and I tell this story all the time, they didn't want me to fast. But once Ramadan came around, and uh, Hakeem and I, you know, Hakeem, yeah. they say you didn't fast on game day. So after the game, we're talking, we're driving. I said, man, I got to get something to eat. <laughs> and I, I told him I was fasting because I didn't know anything about traveling and the exceptions and all of this. And he said, well, if you fast, I'm going to fast. And so I think that next year uh, or that year we began to fast and something came out in CNN saying, well, look, their stats went up in every category. <laughs> <laughs> so the next, year I come, the next year I come back and he passed me on my back. He said, so my mood, uh, when is Ramadan? But, but even, even, even the issues of praying, uh, uh, eventually they ended up giving me a space but yeah, you, you, uh, I would have dialogue constantly, man, on, on, because I was hungry. Because I, like I said, I didn't grow up with this, this heritage uh, that, that, that Craig talked about, right? Growing up in that environment where he was reading and he was around some intellectual heavyweights. Mm -hmm. So but when I was introduced to Malcolm and then I became a Muslim and then meeting a lot of people, well, man, I'm like, now nah, I'm thirsty. I want to know. And I don't want to know just for the sake of knowledge. I want to know because I want to do, because this life is short. And it's always bigger than us as individuals, right? And, and so, I mean, it, it was a, 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 what was I gonna say? God dang it, I lost my frame of thought. Uh, we're talking about, um, this happened, this happened. Uh, what, what were we talking about? Help me, help me. When you came into the league, you sort of, you didn't have that, that background. And so you were coming into knowledge of Islam and you were studying and you were learning as you were coming into the league at the same time. Uh, studying and learning, uh, coming to I mean, God dang it, I hate when that happens. You know what that happens to you? It happens, bro. It happens. God dang Especially it. when you're fasting. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, alhamdulillah. It'll come you know, back. And one, of, and one of the things that, like, like Mahmoud was saying, was, uh, you know, how when he fasted, yeah, and uh, Hakeem, how they played better and, and, team, and the team wanted to know where they're going to fast again. Mm. It, was, it was similar to when we went to the White House and people saw me in and the dashiki, they were like, man, it was international news or whatever. But I had wore dashikis for every playoff game for two straight seasons when we won championships. So <clears throat> the national media was used to seeing it. It was when we got on the international stage, it became an issue. Let me, let, let me come back to that too. I, what I was gonna say, I'm glad you, you kept talking, is that when, when you had those issues and they had those problems, but really the major problem is when you begin to engage people in conversation. And we would be on the plane and on the buses. And like I said, I was hungry. And so I'm starting to read stuff and I want to share it. That's the thing. That's yes. what not does. You know, the more you read, you're like, you can't keep it to yourself. You want to know what people think. And mm -hmm. then at some point you realize a lot of people, you know, they share your thoughts too. And so it gives you confidence, right? To do more. And we would talk about man politics. We would talk about religion. I mean, yeah. you name it. And I would notice that the, you know, you look, the coaches always sat in the front of the plane. And when players were just doing nothing, like really significant, everybody was enjoying themselves. It was one thing. I started to notice when I began to engage people in conversation, Dale and I would talk, Dikembe Mutombo and I would talk a lot. And when it became political and religious, I would look at the front of the, uh, the plane on the bus. <laughs> and you were, if you're looking at the back of the coach's head, their heads would be like, Right, right. Yeah, sure. again, right. And so <laughs> those things really, they make a difference. And you don't necessarily feel it immediately. But when you, especially when you reflect and you start analyzing what happened in your life, you notice, yeah. you can see the visible change. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you can, and, and because, because people don't want to be challenged oftentimes. They don't want you know, because we grow up and we're, we're in a comfort zone with our information and our knowledge. And that's so when right. you say that, that's different than that, some of us don't respond well to that. We get offended as opposed to, look, let me engage this person to see 
you know, why they think the way they do. And right. it's always an issue. Yeah. It's important, by the way, that we acknowledge just the people watching that, you know, we've been talking about the NBA, um, but it's important that we think about gender across across the spectrum because the WNBA in many ways has been far more progressive and taking more risky stances. Uh, women's soccer players are taking far more and are in, in many ways more tradition writ large uh, with these with, with the with the radical uh, tradition of athletes than the, than the male sports. And so that's just another thing I wanted to put out there uh, before yeah. before we take some more questions from folks. There was a person who had a and one of the things, one of the things with that is right now, I think on planetary wise, we got to realize where we at. You know, we're moving into the age of Aquarius, man, and we there now. So it's a it's a feminine energy, and that's why you see them seeming like as though they have more courage to speak about things and and the like. And I think it's one of those things that for me, to look at you know the ascension of women in leadership, the ascension of women across the board that. To me, I grew up. I grew up with sisters having power, so it's not a it's not a problem for me to see it or consider it a challenge. But it's for me, is to consider it. You know, now we have more more uh, feet on the fire, more people going at it. So I think I have no problem with. It. I think now we have to realize what it is and see it for what it is. That it's a, a righteous time for everybody to come to the call. You know what? You know what? You said something. I mean, whether. <laughs> When, the way I look at that is, whether it's the year of Aquarius, Pisces, I think historically, mm -hmm. women, when you look at the history, yeah. they have taken a lot of major positions. And the thing that fascinates me more, I like, I'm a competitor. And I, yeah. and, and I look at it in a good way. Mm -hmm. But they're putting pressure on us. Oh, as right. Because look, if you're looking at both genders, it's no secret yes, that sir. according to genders, they've been the most maligned, the most oppressed, yeah. Right. The most subjugated than the, if you if you comparing genders and the fact that they're in this position and as you said in the WNBA they're taking more risk. That we should take that personal. Right. <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not gonna let you do this. Right. Right. It's, it's right. like you know it's like the culture of relationships and and I, and I don't want to but it's like when you think about especially if you're old fashioned you think about men and women right and if there's somebody getting ready to. To, to engage you in a fight, you're not gonna let your your woman initiate that fight. <laughs> right. I mean, you applaud her, and you applaud her when she does, you praise her because she stands up, but you know, like, no, I, no, I, I gotta do more. <laughs> right, yes sir. So my hat goes off to him. Yeah. Right. Uh, Sally, do we got other questions coming in? We, uh, we did have one question, a question that came in multiple times and these came in through the zoom and people emailed us these and one theme uh, uh and we had three or four questions come about the formation of a sustainable alliance of black athletes in, in your views on that how um is something like can something like that be chartered in in today's environment and in today's I think, I, you know really i think um and that's that's great to even hear that to hear that coming through because i think right now i think we have to be more mature in our movements and as far as realizing where we come from, realizing what works and what doesn't work through the past movements, whether it be the civil rights movement, whether it be the nationalist movement, what what strategies work and what strategies have been found true to to work. So right now I feel like we're in a position to be able to utilize what the league has already done, whether it be major league baseball, football, whatever. They are in the major cities. We are in a major city. So if we can utilize that same map and set forth where athletes who are wherever you're at, you're picking up the mantle, and we're able to have one voice or one similar voice in different urban centers so that we can move in a unified front. But more importantly, I think it's just a matter of us standing up for what's right wherever we are. You know, it's, 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 uh, I, I like that question. One of the things I thought about was you know, I, I don't know which one of one of you said it, but finances can often be an influence on whether somebody speaks or somebody don't speak. Yes, and sir. even when you look at whether it's college, whether it's the NBA, but in particular the NBA, because so many people are making tremendous amount of, of money. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when there are issues of concern and people like the Kaepernick's, like Craig Hodges, who have taken positions, and you know that they're going to be financially hit, 
You know that this is the case. And not everybody, look, man, we have families to feed. You know, we don't always make the best choices. Some people are more savvy with their, their business dealings than others, but some of us aren't. And then things are going to happen. You know, that income is going to dwindle. And, and, and I've talked about, and I think it's something that maybe to consider. You know, uh, I was asked about my, my son, uh, if they had to choose between going to LSU and going to Kentucky, which one would it be? And I said, well, hands down from what I heard about Kentucky, it's going to be Kentucky. I said, because I heard they have a fund that, that alumni put away that if you're 20 years out and you want to go back and get an education, that it's fully paid for. And I said, to me, this is a university that cares about, even if they don't like you as a person, it's a smart right. business move because the word of mouth will say, man, look, if I don't make it, right. they're going to pay my whole education. Plus, they're going to give me a job. They're going to find me. I still have to earn it but they have that set up because of, 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 of what you contributed to the university and the wealth that you were able to, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to bring. But I said, well, if we could as athletes come together and have a fund where we put money away for people like a Craig Hodges who take positions, they're gonna be financially hit. I think even things like that could help, right? Give people, because there's something about being financially secure that helps to give you confidence, makes you move a little bit more freely. That could, I think, uh, uh, be something that could, could influence us to speak out more, to exactly. take positions more, because we yeah. know that, look, man, we covered. Yes, yes. We got a team. You know, yes. we're not going to be hurt like that. And I don't know. That's just something. It may, it may, it may be relevant to the question, but it's something that, that, that came to my mind when, when I heard the question. It's needed and necessary. Yeah. You know, it's an important point for those who don't remember when Muhammad Ali was blacklisted from boxing. Uh, it was colleges and universities. It was it was academics and activists who brought him in that enabled him to stay financially afloat for those couple of years when he wasn't able to box. I, I got a quick question. So I'm, I'm I'm a big soccer fan, and there's a, a an Arab. Uh, soccer player by the name of Karim Benzema. He plays uh, for uh, Real Madrid and also out of France. He said something that really uh, resonated with me a couple of years ago. He said that when I, when I score, I'm French, but when I don't score, I'm an Arab. <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you take that quote, uh, Mahmoud and Craig? What is that quote? How does that quote register with you and your respective experiences? You know, what's funny to me is that you, he made that difference. You know, one time somebody was talking and MJ said, you know, to the people upstairs, y'all black, but I'm green. You feel me? And it's, it's you know, it's a similar situation. And, and that's, some, that's a cold, it's a cold, but when you look at the society and civilization we live in, we see how it's gotten there. So I tell people right now, you don't want to look at America and say, and the world, we want to say, oh, we want to get to the bottom of things. But you want to go, you got a 90-story building. You want to go to floor number one, but you don't want to go to the foundation, the basement where the slaves built it. So don't, don't even talk about changing anything until we get to the root. And, and I know that none of the nations want to do that, man. Yeah. That's real. We got a question coming in. Uh from um, Justin Hansford, brilliant, brilliant attorney. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, question, What's up, Justin? Uh, do black athletes have book clubs or study groups formed on political education? Man, that's... No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard of one yet, right. No. <laughs> no we don't. And, and you know what's so crazy, man, is that when I was with the boys, like, like McMood said, you know, it's like when you learn a new move, you show it to your boy. Cause you man, check this out, man. I got this. It's the same thing with our study. When you get it, you're excited because man, this is this is some cool stuff. And you try to share it. And oftentimes brothers be like, ah, that's kind of ah, I can't I can't get with it. That's you. You can that's that's good for you, but it's too much heat for me. Yeah, it's 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 uh, as a group, no. Uh, I think it's something that uh is definitely needed, man. Information is power. We already know that, you know, the the cliche or whatever, but something that I used to do when I was in the NBA, actually, uh, when I came across a book, there was this bookstore called uh, Salam Bookstore on Colfax, and it had all types of books, man. I mean, you name it, uh, educational books, religious books, 
And I literally probably bought everything that the brother had in there. And I would go sit with him and I would have, you know, we just have discussions on a day-to-day basis when I was in town and after practice. And I would come across a book that I thought was enlightening. And I thought that other people would, you know, would resonate with it. I would buy four or five copies. And so I would have my own copy, of course, that you highlight and write Mm -hmm. around the borders. But I would take those books on the road with me. And if I, because you don't want to just give your books to anybody. You want to give it to somebody <laughs> that may read it. And I would entertain, you know, uh, I would get into conversations. And it was a practice of mine to, if I felt that a person was interested, they were excited about the information, I'm handing the books out uh, to these people. But in terms of, man, that would have been a great, great thing to do then. And that would have yeah. been a great thing to do now if, yeah. if that could happen. Absolutely. I don't know if the NBA would want that, that type happen. of book club, but uh, I think it, I think it would be, I think it would be fantastic. It would, it would probably have to be on a low. I mean, I, I know I, I communicate with a lot of NBA players, and I and I send them books and I give them book lists and stuff. But it's always very private because every because everybody's afraid that that they're one wrong book choice away or one wrong statement away from losing it all. I think that's why. So, brother, brother Hill, let me ask you something, brother. You know, as we sit here, what is the possibilities like right now? People are watching and listening. Can this be the starting point for yeah. that that we're talking about? And possibly could we utilize your university or, what, you know, we need to figure out what we can do to be able to, to, you know, people are listening. How can we continue this momentum? Because like we say in the game, momentum is wild that you don't know when you have it a lot of times, but you damn sure know when you lost it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and we have this discussion here so bad. So, so long in coming. Let's keep it moving, brother, because I think I think it's so many other people that are listening to this that want to be a part of it and know that it's the right thing to do. I, I would, I, if I can, uh, uh, I, I would try to add this too, and I know there's always a starting point, that if or when uh, this idea uh, comes to fruition or whatever, I would I would even suggest, because I thought about it myself in terms of a book club, that not only do we read the information, but whatever we're reading, let's take this information off the paper and yeah. apply it. Like, yeah. okay, what are we yeah. going to do with it now? I don't, I don't care, even if at the minimum we're going to teach a class, but let's try to take the information and make something out of it so it's just not information that we have in our heads, but you know, it's, it's, it's not something that, 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 that we are, you know, putting on the ground, so to speak. Exactly. I agree. Right, right. Yeah, to, to, to Craig's point, you know, you know, God willing, inshallah, you know, I, we'd love to have you both and Brother Mahmoud here in Detroit to speak directly with students when things get back to normal. If they ever get back to normal, you guys have an open invitation to Wayne State University to come and speak to the students, but also the city, uh, the city broadly. Yeah, man, I miss you oh, I'm yeah. down the road, brother. Well, look, I'm not, I'm not going to be, I'm, look, I'm not going to be uh, silent about it. I do this wherever I go. When I go to universities or when I go anywhere, I'm always asking people, what's your book list? Mm-hmm. You know, give me the stuff you reading. So I'm saying it to Lamont. I'm saying it to you, brother. Abay Doom, after we hang up, please send me a book list. I will. Because I'm always, I'm, I, I'm proud. <laughs> I'm proud that I, I've spent way more thousands in books. <laughs> Than, 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 than other things, but you, it's brother. just not on my shelf. So please send me that list, man, and I'll get to it. And then if, and if, and if, and if, in any way possible, uh, once I, once I finish reading, uh, I'm gonna reach out to you and, and, and hopefully have dialogue with you about it. Cause this is how we learn. This is how we grow. That's right. Yeah, it is, brother. That's right. I think we, we'd be remiss if we didn't bring up the name of uh, Ahmad Arbery, yeah. his, his uh, murder in Georgia. Yeah. Uh, obviously has made waves uh, in the last week or so. H- how did that strike you on a personal level, Craig and Mahmoud? If you guys can speak to, to his, you know, his killing, you know, his murder. It's ridiculous, man. Once again, you know, you think um, where we at, man, it, it's, it's murder and mayhem again, you know, and it's coming at the hands of those who supposedly protect and serve and all of this garbage. And then you look at the brothers. How can you, not, how can you just be jogging down the street and things go down like that? It's, it's, um, 
it's sad and in, in the city of Chicago we've seen it way too much and now you see it you see it everywhere across the country man and that's why what we're talking about is so desperately needed because we can I think we have some of the remedies to those issues you know uh for me man two two uh, two things came to mind uh there's a book by Ben Crump called called Open Season and he talks about just even you know, constantly being exposed to these images, right? And these stories for us, it's like a slow genocide, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and we, you know, it just really makes you feel even more so how disposable, you know, we are uh, in, in, in the system's eyes. And it reminds me of, of something that Randall Robinson said in his book, Quitting America, in terms of how we view, like Craig Todd just said, we can, you know, whether you're selling cigarettes, whether you're jogging down the street, you know, it becomes so easy to take a black life and then, make excuses for taking it. But he mentioned something, he said, never in the history have millions of people been deprived of everything except respiratory function, family, culture, religion, you name it, mother, father, and still considered menaces to society. And so when you see stuff like that, it just, it just, it just, it just sends home that message even more of how we view, which also means, you know, how I think critical it is for us to jail together. Right, right? now. And right. to really develop a strategy and an organization and to where this type of thing, man, diminishes by far. Exactly. It's sickening. I mean, it's really sickening. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had a, uh, a question, another question that came in. Um, sorry, I'm just going uh, through these now. What is the fear of facing these racism issues? Is it simply money, control, and power, or all of the above? What, to me, you know, it's just like you say, fear, 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 fear life. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That if you if you are fearful, there's no way you're going you're gonna to be able to stand up, especially on this, on what's necessary and needed. You know, and so many times if we just open our mouths, which to me, like McMove, you know, just saying it's a lot, you know, to him, it's not a big thing. It's something that you do, you know, and it's something that we speak on. So if we speak about something, it's not a, you can't be afraid, man. I think that's the biggest thing, man, that, that paralyzes us is that they, they going to do something. Who, what about, watch out for them. And, and we never, we never say who they and them are to be able to say, all right, let's they and them, let's get down. We, you know what I'm saying? Let's stand up and stand on the merit of, of having some courage, man, and knowing what you're going to say can carry your way within your community. I, I would say, I would say it's all of the above. I would say sometimes, you know, uh, things like uh, being afraid that you're not going to be able to take care of your family, uh, being afraid that by saying something that people don't like, that your life could be put it, you know, uh, put in jeopardy, that physically there's physical harm that can come your way and or your family's way. Uh, I believe, I believe all of those things uh, detract from a person taking positions, um, uh, you know, regardless of what it is, you know, um, yeah. And um, there was some requests also just to, to put this in there, the book list you guys put together, post those on your Instagram pages. A lot of users want to know what you guys are sure. recommending as well. Uh, a a two-part question that came in. Um, how, what was your initial reaction when a lot of your teammates were not vibing or not driving with a lot of what you um, uh, were doing? They just weren't, you know, were, were turning you off or moving away from you and were maybe distancing themselves from you? What, what experience did you have with the teammates who did not agree with you? Right. And what, um, who are some of the players, if you want to name publicly, who have done work behind the scenes that we may not hear of or we may not know that they're back there, they're doing the work, they're pushing the effort, they're part of the movement, but are kind of low-key, we don't really uh, recognize. So it's a, it's a two-part question on that one. Well, the... The second part of it, you know, behind the scenes, there are a lot of brothers and sisters doing a lot of stuff, man. And, and you know, I, to speak of any, I, don't, I can't really speak any, but I know oftentimes when I'm in the community, you can see them. Right. Um, and what was your first part? The first part of it was? The, the initial reaction on how uh, teammates that, that didn't right. agree with you. Right. So for me, for me, it's one of those things that um, I study black studies, man. And, and for me, it's one of those things that you don't, you don't cow down to not speaking on who you are. So when I was afraid, when I was a rookie in the league, Bill Walton and Bill Walton was the, the main veteran. He, he and I would have great conversations about conscious things and, 
what it was like to study under Dr. Karinga and the like. So it was one of those things for me that I always, you know, you throw a little bit of you throw a little bit of seed out there and see, like Mahmoud said, who who gravitates to it. But you're never overbearing about it. So for me, I've always been that type of person that if you see me reading something, I'll share it with you. But I'm not gonna go too far to be like, man, you need to see this or you need to see that. You know, I get excited about it and, and show that excitement. And if somebody gravitates to it, then we'll go at it. Right, right. Um, Khaled, maybe you can you can pick up this question. As far as, um, uh, you know, in, in contracts, I mean, can some of these agents and teams put some uh, clauses in the contracts that you can't speak out or maybe stipulate? the activity or what some of the uh, uh, athletes do say or can't say, can they, you know, I mean, it's kind of a, a legal question for our legal professor, but what extent are they going to, or can they go to, if any at all? Can leagues include clauses and in contracts to silence athletes? Uh, n not explicitly, but they do it culturally, right? So there's, <laughs> right. Um, you know, Greg can speak That's directly. Good. Exactly. Yeah. So if, you, if you take specific stances, you're going to be blacklisted. They don't have to make that explicit or express in the contract. They just do it by way of tradition and culture. Yeah. 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 Right. So true. I, I got. I got. A, I got a follow-up question for Mahmoud and Craig. Do you Do you guys think if you would have took the stances you took in the '90s today, would social media have sort of changed the outcome of what what, what could have happened? I, I think so. Uh, no question. No question. But, but 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 also I think too, um, and and you guys may know better than me. It still depends on your type of politics, yeah. your, how you address the issues. Uh, I think social media has changed the game. You know, when Craig and I were coming up, uh, you know, the media more so controlled the narrative, right? Yeah. Even though even though I'm sure Craig, you probably received a lot of support in letters. Right. Mm -hmm. You saw you got the negative as well. Exactly. I received death threats, but I received, man, I'm talking about from atheists, agnostics, Christians, Muslims, yeah. Jews from all different walks of life uh, uh, expressing their support for what I've done. And I'm sure the media was also receiving. I'm, I'm assuming that they were also receiving some of those things. But at then they had a they had more control over the stories that they told. Right. Uh, social media, again, changed the game. And one of the things right. that uh, like when Kaepernick uh, did what he did. Actually, there was this football player, Abdullah, in, in the NFL. He ended up yeah. uh, what, going into prostration. And right when he went into prostration, the NFL said, well, look, we're going to find you, we're going to suspend you. But then people got on social media and said, well, what about Tebow? And yeah. they pulled back. Right. So even though we had those, that support, if the media didn't expose it, right, it then the world wouldn't know. That's now right. it's easier to, to to shed light on those things, which I I believe makes a huge difference. Oh, no doubt. If if they had social media when McMurray was playing, he'd still be playing. <laughs> well, well, likewise. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that that's the funny part about it. You know, it's instantaneous support base now, where you can speak to the issue, and you're gonna have your support base, and then you're gonna have those people who hold people feet to the fire when when they're not, you know, standing up on on right. So. It would have been a great time to play, not only with the social media, but with the ability just to dribble around and shoot the ball whenever you want to. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That's a whole nother conversation. Right. <laughs> um, there, there are a couple of questions that came in, and I think this goes back to um, Mahmoud, something you touched on earlier about international. I mean, what can we do to bridge uh, some of the communities? I mean, there was a, a, a you know, some of the questions about maybe how you could touch on this, you know, using sport, using these movements to bridge the Arab community here with the Arab community overseas. Uh, I know, Mark, you've done a lot of work, you know, tra traveling to Palestine. You've done work, I believe, I think it was through Dream Defenders and, and Ahmed Abu Zanaid uh, and, and the great work he's done. Um, but what, how can we, you know, bring athletes to some of these movements or use uh, some of the lessons or some of these movements and use sport and politics to bring um, more awareness to our international issues? I mean, I, I think it's just what you said. I mean, it's about just coming together. And having these conversations, and 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 and, and after having these kind of, because it starts, everything starts with a conversation, you know, getting together, and then and then being genuine, being honest about, you know, not being too sensitive to where you can't agree to disagree, 
you know, uh, I, was, I was reading something not too long ago and it says, you know, we should agree to disagree, but as long as I, my, your disagreement is not rooted in my oppression, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I think coming together, having these dialogues, and then after having the dialogues, sitting and processing them, analyzing them, and coming up with a blueprint, coming up with a strategy. I, don't, I can't give you right now, okay, A, B, C, yeah. D. Yeah. I definitely believe that's the start. I mean, it's, a lot of us have the, the wealth. We're able to travel. And even, even if you didn't, look, what are we doing right now? Social media. You, right, you, you don't even need to get on a plane, yeah, right? right? And you can get together, you can have these, these conversations, just like the book club. Let's not just have the conversations, let's not just read, but okay, let's put, put, put something together to where we are benefiting society. We're making real changes in right. the society around us. Because a lot of us have information, right? Yeah. But information is, is only as good as, you know, uh, uh, how beneficial it is right. for the world around you. You know, one of the things that I look at when, when I was younger, I remember when Nixon, when Nixon and um, uh, Mao Zedong used the uh, ping pong, ping pong diplomacy. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> we can use basketball diplomacy, you know, sim not, similar to what Dennis tried to do going to North Korea, <laughs> but we might be able to do do something on the level of student athletic exchange programs where we can bring brothers overseas and, and bring them back over here so we can, you know, do some cultural exchange type things that can happen and make us see people for a level of respect. Yeah. Using using the, 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 the notoriety and the platform that we have as athletes and as well as join that, right? Uh, juxtapose that with, you know, People like yourself, like the Lamont Hills, like like the Bay Dunes, right? Those intellectual heavyweights, and you combine both because nowadays, you know as well as I know, a lot of these youth, and I'm not saying it's the right thing to do, they listen to athletes and entertainers, oftentimes more than they listen to their parents and, and educate. Absolutely, That's right? right. So we have to use this this power that we have, right? That okay, we know they're attracted to what we do, they're attracted to us. But let's use that to bring them in the door, but have, you know, these 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 intellectual powerhouses along with it. Exactly. And, and, and that way we, we cover both basically. Yeah. And yeah. then you change, you change the perception. Now they begin to see us linked with you, you link with us. Now when they think of us, they may think of you. Right? They think of you, they may think of us. And so we, 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 in a sense, I guess we close the divide. Exactly. If that makes any sense. Yeah. I got, I got a question. It's kind of off base, but I'm interested in your thoughts about it. So you, you guys were effectively canceled by, by the leagues, right? Blacklisted by the leagues. It was a different kind of cancel culture in the 90s coming specifically from the right. What do you guys think of this new cancel culture coming from the far left today on activists, on athletes? on um, thinkers, um, which kind of sometimes feels like the right, right? This culture that kind of like chills free speech uh, and intellectual thought that's pervasive on social media, pervasive in politics. It's a new kind of cancel culture. To me, it's all the same monster. Yep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, man? And just being able to be, to be clear enough in your mind and your consciousness to see where it's coming from. It's, it's, the, same, it's the same monster, brother. Yeah. Uh, couple questions came in. I, I mean, this is a you can we could spend a whole other session. Is the influence of Muhammad Ali had on you, uh, in your views? Brother, for me, <laughs> I, I'll show we gotta you. ask it. We gotta ask it. There it is. That's right. That's for me. You know, he's the he's the goat. Everybody talks about. It. They want to talk that. Who's the goat? Who's the goat? Who's the goat? Muhammad Ali. Man, nobody, nobody yet has, as in my humble opinion, man, has even come close to measuring up to the the significance that this brother has had on not just athletes, but I mean, you just across the board, just human beings, man. I mean, uh, I mean, wow, I get teary eyed just thinking about it. Yeah, I feel you, brother. Yes, man. I, I look, I'm still, I, I still get mad when I mean I. You know, when I 
when I think about the fights he lost when I was a young boy. Right. <laughs> but, I mean, that's yeah, how much right. love that people had right. for him, you know what I mean? Because of what he stood for, he sacrificed, yeah. I mean, so much. And it, and it wasn't about, you know, his, for, for me, man, his, it, it reminds me of a, a, of a quote in Huey P. Newton's book, Revolutionary Suicide, when he's talking about the two, man. And, and he said, you know, revolutionary suicide, giving your life for something. He said, it's not that we have a death wish. You know, people like Muhammad Ali and people like, you know, uh, you know, scholars and people who take positions and they take risks. It's not because they literally have a death wish. But he said, it's bigger than that. He said, it's that we have such a strong desire to live with peace and dignity that the existence without it is impossible. Yeah. So when I think of Muhammad Ali, I think of a person who, among other ideas and concepts, carried that with him all the time. He said, man, it's impossible, you know no matter what my position is, no matter how much fame or money I have, it's impossible uh, uh, to live a life like that exactly. without happening, so. I think why I admire y'all is because y'all are really in that tradition. And today, I mean, Muhammad Ali had so much to lose and wasn't being asked a lot from, from it, 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 in terms of what he would materially give up, right? Muhammad mm -hmm. It was in the prime of his career, it wasn't it? He had a lot to give. The idea of endorsements wasn't even a thing yet, but the lips right. That's right. Well, right. gonna lose that too. He was he was he was a darling as Cassius Clay. He was losing his fan base, right? And boxing, you don't get younger. No no sport, you get younger. Nobody nobody says ten years later, I'm I'm I'm, I'm quicker and stronger than I was before. So so he was in the prime of his career as a heavyweight, and they weren't asking him to pick up a gun and go on the front line. They were. <laughs> well, this is the, the interesting thing. They were asking him to just do boxing exhibitions, traveling. He didn't have to, he, his life wasn't at risk. Nothing was, little was at stake that night for him. But he knew the stakes, what it meant to, to look right. like he was supporting empire and to look like he was supporting a, a war of aggression, an unjust imperial colonial war. He didn't want no parts of that because of his, exactly. and because of his politics. He could have done that, did some boxing exhibitions and been right back to it and nobody would have said a word. But he knew that he couldn't do it. Today, it's almost the opposite, right? It's like athletes are being, are, being, are, asked, are being asked to sacrifice so little, right? You, you can keep your job. If you're, if you're an, an NBA star and you speak out against a war, an unjust war or a colonial occupation, you ain't going to lose your job. LeBron ain't going to lose his job. Right. <laughs> That's, real. That's the deal. You might lose his. So, so the, 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 it's like we're, we're asked to do so much less. With so much more. Right. That's, that's what makes Muhammad Ali so special, but that's right. what makes y'all so special, man. Mm -hmm. Y'all could be sitting here right now saying y'all did all that stuff after your careers were over. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Y'all could have did this stuff later when there was nothing at stake. Right? Y'all right. did yeah. it when it mattered. Y'all did it when it counted, just like Muhammad Ali. And so to me, the influence of Muhammad Ali on y'all is the fact that y'all did it at the, at, the, at, at the moment where it mattered the absolute most. Just like Alan Kaepernick, and that's and that's why we salute y'all, man. That's why we love. Appreciate that, you, brother. No doubt. Yeah, appreciate, appreciate you. Appreciate that's you. right. Yeah, Bye -bye. I want to I want to shout out Eton Eton Thomas, another former NBA athlete who's no done doubt. incredible that's work, right. an incredible right. writing around political activism, social justice. Which which athletes of today, Craig and Mahmoud, do you look to to um, and recognize as being individuals who are carrying the torch forward? You know, not only in the NBA but across sports. Well, I like what Anthony Takumpo and his brothers are doing in, in Greece and in Africa. You know, they, you know I had yeah. a chance to uh, coach the Nassus, who was in, in, in the deep league with me in New York. And the stuff that they, you know, their story of how they came from, what they came from, and to be able to rise to the top and still know that you're able to give them back. It's off the chain, man. You know, and the stuff like you say, LeBron and Chris Paul and, and what the guys are doing from a conscious end of, of standing up to a level, you know, and that's the thing when you're in the league or any of these leagues, it's a fine line of how much you can possibly say. So, you know, those 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 two groups as far as basketball is concerned for me. Yeah, right. I agree. Uh, I think, you know, we got time for a couple uh, couple more questions. One of them that came in is, is uh, you know, directed to, to Mahmoud, and I think it's one that's a lot of people are asking, and I'm going to ask it here. What, you know, what similarities – between your situation and Colin Kaepernick, what you know, what's different between the times then and now? Have you had a chance to talk to him? Um, are you still in touch with him? And, and what's the relationship relationship like between 
uh, YouTube? Yes, we, we've had conversations, man. Um, he mentioned something in the first conversation that we had that resonated with me. He said this is the most free he's ever felt in his life. And it's that type of freedom that makes it easy for you to go out and do what you do. You don't think about necessarily, you know it's there. You don't think about necessarily the possibility of losing income or losing uh, quote unquote uh, fame because the truth at that moment becomes dearer to you and more important to you than anything else. But I think the difference is or more so than anything. I mean, we had a lot of sim you know, similarities, even in, in, even in the responses, right? Uh, uh, military comes up almost always when, you, when, you're, when you're criticizing America, the relationship, you know, or he wasn't attacking this or having peaceful protests or uh, the hate mail, the, the death threats, those were similarities. But I think the difference, going back to what I talked about earlier, is social media. You know, it's just, it's, it's a different time. Um, even though I had an enormous amount of support, uh, that wasn't something that was, was shared. Uh, now it's easier for people to hear about somebody doing something and you get that support, you know, because people can go on social media, the computer, and it, it can definitely make a huge difference. Right. Um, and, I, and I love the fact too, man, that, that, that Kaepernick, what he, what he did also was not only did he talk about it, he went out and he, and, and, I, and I know it's, it's him, but also he has an enormous group that he works with, uh, people that support him, you know, so, so to have the Know Your Rights campaign, to do all the things that he's done along with that is just yeah. is, is amazing to me. Um, and I, I kind of got, I, I was envious because I said, I didn't necessarily have that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that understanding and, and that, that insight uh, or to be able to do that. But it's definitely inspirational and motivational. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and my, my man, I, I applaud brothers. I mean, anybody really, whether it's on a, a huge level or a small level who's out there really trying to make a difference. But I do believe this, that because we have such a platform and uh, it, it, it seems we, could, we, can, we can reach out to people more than the average, it's kind of irresponsible to just limit what we do to being private. Some of it has to be exposed yeah. because th th there's a public that's, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, supporting you through paying to come see these games. There's a public that's supporting you for buying your products. So, and, that's, and, and that's allowing you to be public and to do the things you do. So you can't just keep everything silent and quiet. Right. That's, I, that's just my humble opinion. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, we, we, we could go on all day. Um, and I do appreciate you guys coming, but we have, we, I don't want to take up too much of your time. We do have a ton of questions coming in, but what I want to do is for our, our viewers and our membership um, and folks that are going to be streaming this, I'm hoping that we could do a follow-up uh, because the questions that are coming in, the conversations that are, that are happening are very important. They're very timely. Um, uh, Can I say are, something? Uh, yeah, yeah I would like to tell all. I would like to tell all the mothers out there, happy Mother's Day tomorrow and, and enjoy yourselves and be safe. That's right. That's right. Thank you. And yes, yeah, stay safe. Uh, um, one, one point, I mean, we, we are an Arab organization, so hopefully next time we'll, we'll dive into our memberships. Wanted to talk a little bit more about the Palestine struggle and the liberation struggle over there and how we can do that here. And that's definitely something we will put, uh, dive deeper into, but we are uh, up against time. Uh, before we wrap up, I do want to thank uh, Brother Malik Aziz from uh, Chicago, now in Tampa for helping put this together and lending his expertise. Um, it's, it's great that we had so many people involved. It's great that we were able to bring everybody together on such uh, short notice. For those of you that are just watching uh, something with ADC, uh, visit our website, adc.org, make a contribution if we can, so we can keep the doors open, keep a good fight going. Um, this will be posted. Uh, again, I hope that we can uh, do something again. I wanna thank uh, Khaled, I want to thank Mark, I want to thank Greg, Mahmoud. I mean, this has been uh, incredible, and I, I certainly hope we can do this again in the near future. Appreciate so, you, brother. Let's do it. Appreciate you. Much love. Thank you. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Bye-bye.